Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, August 23rd, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps from the office from my apartment. Not really, but steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, John Abramson, physician lecturer at Harvard uh, Medical School and author of Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare and How We Can Repair It. Meanwhile, the New York Times is reporting that the National Archives found over 150 classified documents at Mar-a-Lago in January, which triggered the federal investigation. In total, 300 sensitive documents have been recovered since Trump left office from Trump. Speaking of that guy, Trump has filed a lawsuit in response to the search, Trump versus United States government. It's me against the world. He's calling for a third party to review the seized materials. And he filed in such a way that his case got uh, assigned to one of his extreme judicial. Another court filing related to Trump has revealed that ICE officials were told to wipe their phones before leaving the agency. And they did. Delete the evidence, best practices in the Trump White House. Today is primary day in New York and Florida, so get out there and vote. CNN is reporting that the Biden administration has settled on a means-tested $10,000 student loan debt cancellation. If you make over 125k a year, you could be exempt. But again, this is like maybe the tenth time they floated this to the press. So make your voices heard. No means testing. Mitch McConnell's Senate Leadership Fund is going all in on Herschel Walker in Georgia, pumping millions of dollars into that race. Good luck. A new analysis shows that one in three American women have now lost access to abortion due to state restrictions and bans post Roe. That's over 20 million women and counting as more restrictive laws are coming. The Uvalde shooting victims, families, and survivors have announced a $27 billion civil rights lawsuit targeting law enforcement and the gun manufacturer. I hope they win every penny. In California, Gavin Newsom has vetoed a bill that would implement safe injection sites throughout the state, even though evidence overwhelmingly supports their efficacy. China has been facing record temperatures and a massive drought in the west central part of the country. And lastly, Russia is accusing Ukraine of murder in the assassination of Daria Dubina. Murder, how dare they? What is war then? All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome back to the show, or welcome to the show, if you haven't seen us before. Uh, I'm Emma Vigeland. Normally I don't broadcast from home, but I'm on, uh, I think, my 10th day of COVID, and I still see a very, very faint little line, the faintest line. Um, so just taking precautions, making sure you know, I don't get anybody else sick. Uh, but but we have Bradley back from vacation. Say hello, Bradley. I'm back. 
and uh, Matt Leck with here uh, with us here as always. Uh, we've got a great show for you. I said this in the headlines, um, but <clears throat> today's election day. There's a special election in Oklahoma, but really the focus for at least listeners on the left side of the aisle will be in um, New York and in Florida, where in New York, at least, there's a ton of really interesting races and in our district uh, here in Brooklyn as well, many parts of Brooklyn, at least where I live. Um, New York 10 is shaping up to be uh, a really important race. Uh, Yuli New is the front runner right now. Um, based on polling against this corporate hack named Dan Goldman. Uh, he's self-funded and ha comes from a long lineage of, of big money here in New York. Of course, the New York Times editorial board endorsed him. Mondaire Jones is also in this race due to the redistricting, and it's really unfortunate for him. He got the short end of the stick, uh, but it seems like the left is kind of coalescing, coalescing behind Yuling Nu. She's who I'm going to be voting for today. Um, Carlina Rivera was also a good candidate as well, but it was a crowded field. And really, I think the number one priority is defeating Dan Goldman, um, who's been blitzing this area with ads about his role in the Trump impeachment um, trial. But in terms of policies, Yuli New is definitely the person that you would rather have representing this very progressive district. Um, Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler are also facing off. This is the race I think that most of the national media is interested in because it's now the Battle of the Upper East and Upper West Side. Um, the newly redistricted 12th district is where they will be uh, battling it out. And I think also people are interested in that from the national press's standpoint <clears throat> because they're both incumbents. They've both been in power quite a long time. Um, but it seems like Jerry Nadler is going to win. We don't know that for sure, but Maloney is like pulling out all the stops, calling him senile when I think Maloney's older than him, <laughs> um, which is hilarious. I mean, the seal might be starting to break on the senility point. I mean, it's interesting too, that she brings that out when she was the one who let it slip basically that uh, she thinks that Biden is not going to run again. Mm. Well, it's also funny that both Nadler and Maloney in the debates are like, Siraj Patel is a child. And he's like, I'm 38 years old. <laughs> he's yeah. like, I'm, a full, I'm almost 40. <laughs> like, I'm not like an intern. By those, by those, uh, I mean, I guess by their standards, right? Like, that is a child. Uh, right, but right. it's hard to make the senile point and then also make that point about Patel. Right. <laughs> um uh, Melanie Dorigo is another really great candidate. She's running in uh, around a lot of Suffolk County, Long Island. Um, Alessandra Biaggi is running against D Triple C Chair Sean Patrick Maloney, who is crooked, <laughs> uh, in my opinion, in the new 17th district. Biaggi is the candidate to support there if you're on the left. Um, and then we have statewide races uh, in New York as well. Uh, Gustavo Rivera, who came on our uh, on our live show in Brooklyn is an incumbent progressive who we should support who's facing a challenge from um, the more institutional Democratic Party forces there also the whole DSA slate Kristen Gonzalez you might have heard of her support her David Alexis Jabari Brisport uh, Julia Salazar as well lots of uh, just look up the DSA slate if you're here in New York and I'd encourage people to to support them um, and Floridians, Floridians, Maxwell Frost. Uh, if you're in that district, vote vote for Maxwell Frost. Uh, he's up against Alan Grayson, who is one of the worst guys in politics. So vote for Maxwell Frost. Yeah, what happened to Alan Grayson? Because I met, I I thought that he and and I was green when I met him and we were doing like interviews with him at TYT, but. I thought that he was try was positioning himself at one point as a progressive, but didn't he have some allegations against him? Yes, yeah, so like he he was he he was in this like bitter primary against Pat Murphy to to uh, to go up against Marco Rubio in in the Senate race a few years ago, and then his career kind of went up in flames because he was incredibly accused of assaulting his wife, and so now he's just trying to make a comeback. He's a terrible oh. guy. Okay, gotcha. And Maxwell Frost is like a you know DSA back twenty four year old activist. He's a he's a great candidate. So hopefully. Hopefully get some support today. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and then, of course, there's the gubernatorial primary between Charlie Crist uh, in Florida and, and Nikki Freed. Um, Charlie Crist was a Republican for a while, uh, so uh, that, that kind of says it all, does it not? Um, and, and Freed is the agricultural, agricultural commissioner down in Florida, and she, uh, I think she's like one of the only Democrats uh, in a position like that under the DeSantis administration. So, um, you know, they'll both, either candidate will probably get clobbered by DeSantis in the fall, but you got to have a strong one, the stronger candidate up against him uh, just for posterity. And uh, I do want to mention, too, that there is a special election between a Democrat and a Republican uh, in New York 19, which is uh, Delgado's old seat since he was appointed to be lieutenant governor. Um, the Democrat is Pat Ryan, and it's basically another one of these races where abortion is on the ticket by proxy. Um, Pat Ryan has been running a, a, a campaign focused on abortion rights, and by contrast, his Republican opponent has been um, uh, not. So those are some of the races to watch. Uh, we will have more on that tomorrow once the results roll in. Um, but first, let's turn really quickly before we, we get to our guest, John Abramson. Here is Don Jr. <laughs> I mean, he seems to be doing his best Jim Brewer impression at a rally for Representative Matt Gates, trying out his stand-up routine. If you were to hire a comic for, uh, I don't know, an event that you were putting on, just think, would you rather have Don Jr. or Jim Brewer? I was actually having this uh, uh, debate internally last night after I saw this clip. Here he is at a rally for Matt Gates, desperately trying to make the crowd laugh, talking about uh, how it would actually be a good thing if his dad held on to the nuclear codes. Donald Trump has the nuclear codes! <laughs> I'd say that if Donald Trump actually still had the nuclear codes, it'd probably be good. Yeah. Our enemies, our enemies might actually be like, okay, maybe let's not mess with them. Unlike when they look at Joe Biden and they say, you know what, we should attack now. Oh, oh man. He, <laughs> I, I, so, like, what is this style of uh, coked out campaigning that he's, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, but uh, that he seems to be patenting here. I don't know, like, how effective this is, right? Because yeah. all of um, this is just, I mean, my, we, we, we are being unfairly attacked as opposed to this is our vision for what we want in America. Yeah, uh, the Knowledge Fight guys had a recent episode where Orange, Owen Schroyer did stand up. And it's, it's this sort of thing. It's just bravado. And waiting for applause lines instead of like jokes. <laughs> yeah, if you say something with emphasis, and then you say make something funny the libs won't want you to say after, and you stare at him like he's just he has to get the cockatoo down, and then he could really open for Jim Brewer. Man, um, like yeah, that's all it is. But I think it just really falls flat. And I know that there have been um, attacks leveled at the FBI. Um, uh, violent rhetoric directed at them, but let's be honest, like that's what they're made to respond to those kinds of things. It's not good, but it's different than, I don't know, uh, Republicans riling up hate against minority groups, for example. They're, they're, they're very equipped to respond to violent threats for sure, especially against themselves. Uh, but other than those crazies, I, I just like don't see the aggrievement from Donald Trump breaking the law, being a galvanizing force for Republicans at at the polling uh, booth. Because, yeah. I, I mean, I keep returning to this point that Ryan Cooper made a few weeks ago on the show, which is that in 2016, Hillary Clinton ran on a platform about, or a, a messaging campaign that was, I'm it's my turn. <laughs> I'm with her. Get ready for I'm Hillary. Owed, 
I'm owed this, right? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what Donald Trump has reverted to uh, in, in 2022, ironically, which is that, you know, I, I, this was unfairly stolen from me, 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 as opposed to drain the swamp, build the wall, uh, all of those more simple messaging campaigns that made him an effective candidate in 2016. Now yeah, it's just it's, these rich guys sla flailing around and talking about how unfair their lives are. I don't know. Yeah, if you ran on Make America Great Again the first time, and then now it's like, it's all lost. Everything's as bad as it's ever been. It's like, well, you kind of undercut what you said you'd do. Like, why is it so bad? It's it's bad because of all the bad people that are still doing the bad things to me now. I, I just um, needed a second term, and it, this all would have been fi figured out. Which makes him fairly like indistinguishable from any president running for a second term. Which is like, why, <clears throat> why didn't good things happen? Well, it's because of all these other reasons. So it's an uphill battle to make that case. But when you're still in power, you have the bully pulpit of the president. Trump is out of power. His Twitter has been uh, he's been banned from Twitter at least for now. He doesn't really have a great way to communicate with the general population outside of his crazies and um yeah. and truthing it up on truth social like i just I, maybe it's wishful thinking on my part but i no, do not see this as an effective uh attack i think it's a problem that we can get to i guess but i just think like that they if i was listening and i was like a media person hearing donald trump jr say that i wouldn't like, I don't know how the normal audience member reacts, but if I was like somebody who had been covering for his dad and saying like, oh, he had probably had nothing there. You should have just asked politely and he would have gave you the stuff. I'd be worried about what this actually means. Like, oh, wait, did he have actual really stuff that he was retaining? Are you trying to like prepare us for that revelation now? The, well, they've, they've gone from it's uh, like a, a bunch of different things like that. Th well, that was the reason that they said that they were bringing in backpacks and backpacks of evidence was because I think they know that some of what he had there is going to come out. And so mm -hmm. they're, they're bracing for that. But we'll see. I mean, I, I do actually think that the past few months, even though this guy's Teflon, I do think the past month or so, few months of these investigations has cut uh, – Donald Trump's chances of actually winning the Republican nomination down. Yeah, I still think he's the front runner, and we'll yeah. see. Once he gets on that stage and he trash talks, there's there's no end in sight to how he can appeal to the Republican voter. But yeah, um, yeah. all right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to be joined by Dr. John Abramson. joined now by Dr. John Abramson, physician and lecturer at Harvard Medical School and author of Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare and How We Can Repair It. Uh, John, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Of course. So um, I, I guess let's start uh, really with um, a way for our audience to understand the full context of in which you wrote this book, which is basically part of your personal story. Um, you know, your path from being a physician with your own practice to being an outspoken critic 
of, of for-profit healthcare in this in this country, and a lot of that starts with with Vioxx, uh, the drug released by Merck. Take us through that that time period in your life and and what that led to in terms of revelations about the healthcare industry. Sure. So I was a family doc. I, I uh, opened up my uh, practice in 1982, about an hour north of Boston, and I was very happy as a family doctor. I became chair of family medicine at Leahy Clinic, and I was teaching at Harvard Medical School, and really quite happy being in the community and part of the community. Um, I had done a Robert Wood Johnson Fellowship at the end of my residency, and I had learned uh, research, design, statistics, and epidemiology with the uh, idea of being able, having the option to go into an academic career, but it decided that I really like taking care of people in the community. So that's what I was doing, and I was doing it happily. But as the late 90s approached, it became clear that the drug companies were having a greater and greater influence on what doctors thought the right way to teach their, treat their patients was. Um, the first example was hormone replacement therapy with the idea that all postmenopausal women should, without a contraindication, should take uh, hormone replacement therapy, even as the evidence grew that hormone replacement therapy increased the risk of breast cancer. And yet the drug companies, even my colleagues, were going to uh, continuing medical education courses that continued to ab advocate the use of hormone replacement therapy. Uh, for postmenopausal women. And then Vioxx came along. Vioxx was a, an arthritis drug that uh, doesn't provide any better uh, relief for, for arthritis pain or other kinds of pain, but ostensibly decreased the risk of serious GI bleeds. And I got into the FDA data, which was very hard to get into, but once you're there, there's a treasure trove of information. And what the FDA data clearly showed was that Vioxx was a dangerous drug and more than doubled the risk of serious cardiovascular complications compared to routine arthritis drugs. And what had happened is the New England Journal of Medicine had published Merck's big study that claimed to show that Vioxx was a safer drug than the other anti-inflammatory drugs. And yet in black and white, the FDA was saying, no, this is wrong. This is a more dangerous drug. And I was continuing to practice at that point. Vioxx was the most heavily marketed drug to consumers. My patients were coming in demanding Vioxx because that was the latest and best therapy. And the, the disparity between what the New England Journal and the drug advertising was convincing doctors of pa and patients of on the one hand, and the truth about this, which is that it was a deadly drug and probably ended up killing between 40 and 60,000 Americans. That disparity was just too much. And at that point, I decided I was gonna leave my practice and write a book about the drug company's influence. That book was published in 2004. It was Overdosed America. So uh, can you explain for the audience why the FDA would have uh, a disparate uh, level of information or why there would be a different conclusion reached by, uh, with the FDA data as opposed to the, the New England Journal? Yeah, great question. So <clears throat> the drug companies are supposed to turn over all their data to the FDA when uh, and the FDA evaluate, evaluates that. Now, that didn't quite work out, and we can talk about that if you want to. But the key point here is that the New England Journal published this peer-reviewed article that said, concluded that Vioxx was a safer drug than older anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, why did the, the, new, the FDA got it right? Because they had most of the data. The really important question here is why did the New England Journal get it so wrong? And that exposes a lot of the problems in American medicine and how, what doctors know about how to practice. The issue is that the New England Journal, which is the most respected journal in the United States and probably the world, is a peer-reviewed journal. When a manufacturer or any, when, when a clinical trial results are submitted to the New England Journal, they go through peer review, and the peer reviewers ostensibly 
look at the data, look at the article, and make sure that the article presents a reasonably accurate and complete uh, telling of what happened in the study. The truth is, and this is a truth that almost no doctors know, the truth is that the peer reviewers don't have access to the clinical trial data. They only get access to the summary of the data that's included in the submitted manuscript. And they don't have the actual data. There's no way the peer reviewers can vet that and certify that it's accurate and complete. So what happened is the article um, was, was false and misrepresentative, misrepre misrepresenting the facts because Merck had eliminated three of the heart attacks that occurred in people taking Vioxx. Now you oh. might say, well, gee, the authors should have picked it up and the peer reviewers should have picked it up. But there were um, 13 authors, three of whom were Merck employees, uh, eight of whom, eight, nine, 10, 11, in any event, three <laughs> were Merck employees and the rest were academics. Um, and the academic physicians who were authors of this article didn't know about the excess heart attacks that hadn't been reported. And the FDA knew about them and said they didn't accept the analysis based on uh, not uh, counting those three heart attacks. But the FDA takes a firm stand that they do not take any action to correct a journal article that they know is wrong. I just want to emphasize this for the audience because that is just such an incredible piece of information that I was unaware of that these summaries that are given to the to journals like this and then they can be categorized as peer review I mean those can be heavily influenced by the pharmaceutical industry and the drug manufacturers in in and it, in this instance it was like how common is this practice when you look at the way that drugs are analyzed by journals like this throughout the country. It's universal. There's no peer review that demands access to the clinical trial data. And it gets even worse, Emma, because there's an, there's an enormous conflict of interest for the journals not to create uh, uh, more, more um, uh, better standards for peer review because the New England Journal sold um, almost 900,000 reprints to Merck for a profit that Merck then handed out to physicians showing that the New England Journal said this was a great drug. So the New England Journal has a conflict of interest. They, they sell these uh, 900,000 reprints back to Merck. They take in somewhere around six or $700,000 in, in revenues. And Merck has a, uh, excuse me, the New England Journal has a real incentive not to throw a wrench in this process where Merck had misrepresented the results of its data. And again, this is not an academic issue. 40 to 60,000 Americans died from, take, from the cardiovascular consequences, heart attacks, blood clots, and strokes from Vioxx, and their doctors didn't know that Vioxx doubled the risk. That is just incredible that there is this greasing of the wheels with these journals, which are, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I would say a science noob. It's hard for me to sometimes digest some of this information and not and get it fully. But I knew the New England Journal of Medicine. I've heard of this. I, I totally thought that their word was uh, something that you could fall back on. And like, frankly, from reading, you know, parts of your book about this, like, that your uh, your response to Viox and the response from the New England Journal to your criticism of them was shocking in its vitriol. Can you talk a bit about that? I sure can. Um, this is in chapter one of, of my recent book, Sickening. Um, so uh, Viox got pulled. My, Viox got pulled from the market a week after my book came out, Overdosed America, back in 2004. And I was the guy who wrote the last book, and so I was all over the Today Show and the the big TV show shows, and got a, a whole lot of media coverage. So the medical students at Harvard, um, where I was teaching, um, uh, th this got on their radar screen that this was a big issue, the biggest recall in a drug recall in U.S. history. And they asked me to give a lunchtime lecture. These are optional 
lectures where there's a pretty good lunch provided and um, students can come in and hear about a, a given topic that's being presented. So the students asked me to give a lunchtime lecture on the Vioxx story. And I did, and I told basically this a, a little bit more detail, but the story that I just told you, that Merck had not supplied the New England Journal with the full information from the study, that peer review doesn't get the real data, and the editors hadn't gotten the real data, and that somewhere a total of 40 to 60,000 Americans died because of this. It's probably somewhere around 30 to 50,000 who died after the New England Journal knew that their article was wrong. So I said this straight up, um, just quoting the facts. A lot of the facts came from the Wall Street Journal. At that point, the Wall Street Journal was very interested in pharmaceutical issues, and I worked with their writers, and they wrote it up, and they added some information that I didn't have. And that was fine. And then maybe um, a few weeks later, I got a call out of the blue from the New England Journal of Medicine's uh, editors, editor-in-chief's administrative assistant, who said to me, we know you're going to be giving a, CM, a continuing medical education lecture in a week or two, whatever. And uh, Dr. Drazen, the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal, will see you in his office at 11, p at 11 a.m. And I got a little testy and said, well, I like to talk to the people at the lecture, so let's make it 11.30. So we agreed on 11.30. So I, I, I had no idea what Dr. Drazen had to say to me. I was hoping he had to say that we made an error and we'd like you to write a piece that describes what happens so we can clear, you know, clear the air here and, and get back huh. on track. He said nothing of the sort. He said to me, how do you think I feel when I'm making rounds with Harvard medical students and they tell me you're criticizing an article in the New England Journal. And I said, I, well, I, I can't read your mind. I don't know how it makes you feel, but my impression is that your job as a medical journal editor is to make sure that the truth in whatever form and the best uh, way possible at the time that you make the truth available to American physicians so they can practice the best medicine. Well, he evidently disagreed with that idea, and he thought I should just cease and desist from talking about the New England Journal's role in continuing to support Vioxx uh, even after they knew the story and um, the FDA even uh, had understood the story at that point. And the, the New England Journal kept selling reprints, and he thought I should back off. He didn't say, this is bad for our business, but uh, you can read between the lines. And that just shocked me that the New England Journal, that virtually all physicians think what you think, Emma, that this is the highest source of authority in American medicine, and whatever is published in there, we can believe. And what I found out at that point was that the New England Journal, although a nonprofit organization owned by the Massachusetts Medical Association, Medical Society, um, that the New England Journal was in this money game, just like the drug industry is, just like academic researchers who are working for the drug industry are, and that there's this nexus of influence that creates the illusion that the innovation in American medicine it's great for Americans, and they ought to be happy to pay up for it, when in fact our health is losing ground to the other countries in the world very rapidly while we spend so much more extra money. Well, I mean, and that is <clears throat> that is the central lie, right, which is that the pharmaceutical industry will claim that, um, you know, innovation is what drives these great health outcomes in the United States. and. Um, even you'll, you, it's, it's like a different world if you're on the Republican debate stage where they'll talk about how we have the greatest healthcare system in the world. But as you lay out, um, the, the data on this is obvious and overwhelming. The United States is lagging behind every other comparable country. It, it's, it's unbelievable. The facts are unbelievable. And I w watch as Harvard medical students are not taught these facts uh, and can uh, leave lectures about pharmaceutical innovation with the idea that you just said. The truth is that in 2000, 
Americans rank 38th in the world on healthy life expectancy, how many years we can live in good health, how many years we live in good health, and years of illness are prorated, prorated for the quality of life. So we ranked 38th in 2000. Since 2000, our costs have gone up astronomically above the other wealthy countries, and our ranking has fallen from 38th in the world to 68th in the world. And in fact, since Obamacare was implemented in two, uh, passed in 2010, there's only three other countries in the world who have gone down in healthy life expectancy more than the United States. And these three countries are Syria, Yemen, and Venezuela. Those are the only three countries that have lost more ground on healthy life expectancy than we have since 2010. And though we make innovative products, we're mesmerized by the word innovation to think innovation means a social good. But Jill Lepore, um, uh, a professor of history uh, at Harvard University, wrote a book uh, called These Truths about American history. And she made the point that innovation isn't about social benefit. It's about making money. And the so-called innovation that we're dependent on is only the only dependency that that innovate or the primary dependency that that innovation fills is the return of money to shareholders in the stocks of these companies. But the innovation, only one out of four new drugs is significantly better than other drugs. And we don't even have a mechanism for informing doctors which one of those four drugs is actually better than other ones. And meanwhile, well, yeah. uh, in 19, oh, excuse me, go ahead. No, no, no. It's just it's um, those three countries that you mentioned, two of them are uh, war zones. And then two of them also are victims of United States sanctions, which also cripple their healthcare system. So, um, I mean, like that is, I think, uh, a, a dark picture that you paint. And just as a follow up to that, um, you know, there's for profit pharmaceutical manufacturing worldwide. These are multinational corporations. And like, for example, uh, Germany was instrumental in keeping the intellectual property of the uh, COVID vaccines intact and not allowing for that to be more widely manufactured throughout the world because of Merck um, and the, the, its prominence uh, in, in, or maybe it was Pfizer, I'm, I'm blanking on it, but its prominence in, in Germany. But so why is it so pronounced in the United States? Is it purely because we don't have a single payer system or is there, um, an even greater explosion of influence with for-profit healthcare um, in terms of the industry in and of itself, as compared to other countries that still have some of that, you know, free market healthcare element. Right. That's that's the question, and the the answer is that the United States is a complete outlier in the extent to which the pharmaceutical industry is not regulated. So, for example, virtually all the other wealthy countries have a government or quasi-governmental agency that performs what's called health technology assessment. So when new drugs are approved in the other countries, they are approved and priced according to what the best scientific data shows is their real value in clinical care. We don't have that. And in fact, in the Obamacare legislation, it became against the law for the government to participate in cost effectiveness studies. So when a new drug comes out in the United States, we, and we also don't have price controls, unlike all the other the wealthy countries. So we don't have price controls. The drug companies can charge whatever they want. And um, if you think the peer review fact uh, was shocking, uh, hold on to your couch because the median price of a new drug in the United States, of the new drugs that came out in 2020 and 2021, the median price, meaning half of the drugs cost more than this, is $150,000 a year. That is one of the many jarring statistics in your book. Um, and <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I, go on. 
no, so I was going to say, in the United States, we have this environment where the drug companies can charge whatever they please. And in this new drug legislation where they're going to keep drug company price increases uh, limited to inflation, well, that, you're not giving away very much when half of your drugs cost $150,000 annually out of the blocks. So we've got this unlimited pricing. We have no health technology. Um, we have direct-to-consumer advertising. And it's a perfect setup for the drug companies to hold monopolies, not just on good drugs, but on the brands that create on drugs that don't contribute anything, but they can fortune and use their marketing power to create the impression that these drugs are necessary for Americans to live a good life. And I mean, is part of this too just a, a chokehold on uh that is created by intellectual property and patents. I mean, how central is that to what we're seeing here? It's huge in two steps. Number one is on the front end in terms of transparency before publication. This is critical. So, so peer reviewers don't get to see the data. So the, the articles get published, not on the basis of transparency, and some of the authors agree that within six months they'll make the data available or some agreement like that. But it doesn't matter because once an article is published in a prestigious journal as peer reviewed and the conclusions are out there, the horses are out of the barn. You, you can't tell the truth afterwards and recapture the misrepresentations. So on the front end, the intellectual property, they claim the data is their property. They literally use that language, that they own the data and they don't have to share it. And the primary purpose of that data is for their marketing, to sell drugs. And then on the back end, you get a drug like Humira or the insulins, where they've been on the market for 20 years or so. And the packet, patent thicket is so thick. I think there's 172 patents on Humira so that the drug companies can claim that generic medicines or biosimilar medicines for the biologics, but that the generic form of the medicines can't come on the market because they violate the patents. So the intellectual property issue is on the front end and the back end. It's, uh, it's a safeguard for their profits. I mean, it has multiple trap doors, right? So that uh, th there's, there's no fallout for them. I mean, it's all designed to protect pharma uh, is what I, I, I've gotten from from your analysis here. And I want to go back a little bit to, I think it's chapter two, where you focus on Neurontin, um, which is a Pfizer, a, a Pfizer drug. Um, you know, after this uh, Vioxx debacle, you essentially became persona non grata for the pharmaceutical industry and the, and the for-profit healthcare industry and just like helped, you know, testify in these lawsuits against them and, and one of these cases included Neurontin, um, or was about Pfizer's drug Neurontin. Can you tell that story? Sure. So Neurontin, uh, the, uh, the, the vast majority of Neurontin, which is a drug that had been approved uh, as a second line drug for seizures, and then it got a, it got a second indication, which was to decrease the pain uh, after people have um, shingles, post, post herpetic neuralgia is what it's called, but post shingles pain. That, those are the two indications that it was approved for. About 90% of the drug was prescribed off label. And the trial was about how did those doctors who prescribed the 90% of the drug that was used off label, how did they come to believe that it was beneficial for their patients? And uh, I was privileged to be uh, an expert in that trial. And we figured out, uh, another doctor and a lawyer and I figured out the trick that, that Pfizer used to convince doctors and the public that Neurontin was effective for diabetic neuropathy. When the FDA not only never approved it for diabetic neuropathy, the FDA wouldn't even let Pfizer submit an application for diabetic neuropathy because they said, you're not going to get there, that you don't have the goods. But there was one article that came out in the journal of the American Medical Association that claimed to show that Neurontin was superior to placebo 
for diabetic pain. And um, there were 84 people. The study had 84 people in each group. And the people who took Neurontin had less pain. But, but the trick was that the, it was called a forced titration study design. So the people who were randomized to take Neurontin had their dose elevated to twice the FDA allowed maximum during the course of the study, even if they were better, even if their pain was gone, they were taken up to 3,600 milligrams a day when the FDA had only approved 1,800 milligrams a day. And what that did is it created side effects in 55% of the people who took Neurontin. So what we did studying this article and where the trick was, you know, where the monkey was hidden in the tree is that, that Pfizer had taken, got created side effects in so many people that when those people got uh, side effects, they were essentially unblinded, meaning it's no longer a randomized controlled double blind study because the people with side effects could surmise pretty clearly that they had uh, been randomized to the Neurontin group. So we figured this out and because we're in litigation, we would never would have found this out if we weren't in litigation. But because we're in litigation, the plaintiff's attorneys were able to get the patient level data from that study. And this is an example of why patient level data is so important. A statistician joined our team and he looked at that data and he um, looked at people's pain responses all the way up until they experienced a side effect. And once they experienced a side effect, he took their pain response the last pain response at the visit before they developed a side effect so that the unblinding that was caused by raising the dose up to twice the FDA approved limit would be nullified because those people would be taken out of the study. And when you took the people who didn't have side effects caused by this uh, double uh, the max, maximum allowed dose of Neurontin, there was no benefit. Now, the reason why, this, why I've told this long story about a study that had 84 people in each arm is because Pfizer hired a PR firm and they created what's called 85 million impressions among Americans that said this article showed that people with diabetic pain got significant relief with Neurontin. 85 million Americans, doctors and no doctors, heard this, whether they were sitting in an airplane and trapped or, or, or whether they were watching TV or whatever they were doing. 85 million. And we figured this out and it was presented in open court so that uh, um, uh, the, the documents are unsealed. The, uh, the results of the study of the individual patient level is unsealed once it's open in court. But the, the doctors were so committed to believing the story that Pfizer had convinced them of that uh, Neurontin uh, was an effective pain reliever for neuropathy. The doctors are so committed. This happened in, um, in, two, in 2010. We went to trial, and this became public knowledge. It was written up in a statistical journal by the statistician who did the work. That was 2010. And now in 2022, Neurontin is still one of the six to 10 most frequently prescribed drugs, and most of that prescribing is for pain, which their data doesn't support. And, and in terms of that, that PR blitz that you referenced, my, my impression was that off-label marketing is, is not supposed to be allowed, right? Um, off-label prescriptions can happen at a doctor's discretion, but off-label marketing, I was, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought that was illegal. That's correct. And that's what that trial was about. Okay. So the, the jury, it was a civil trial, it wasn't a criminal trial, but a RICO charge, a racketeering charge was added into the civil trial because Pfizer worked with other for-profit companies to perpetrate this, um, this uh, misinformation in uh, what's called a racketeering enterprise. Um, and the jury found Pfizer not just guilty of fraud, which is what you were saying, you know, that it's, it's not legal, and therefore the insurers who paid for Neurontin 
deserve their money back or the money, the difference between Neurontin and a less expensive drug. But the jury found Pfizer guilty of RICO charges. It was the first time ever that a jury had found a drug company guilty of RICO charges, that's which triples reserved. the financial penalty. I'm sorry to cut you off, but that's usually reserved for, I hear racketeering and it's mob convictions and things like that. I mean, like it is, and you also talked about how essentially what they were forced to pay was just a, a traffic ticket on their, on their way to making even more profits. Can you talk about the sum that they were forced to pay compared to the profits that they make? Correct. So uh, the jury found uh, Pfizer, uh, only one insurer was in the initial trial that I testified in, Kaiser uh, Health Systems. And the judge let that trial go forward because Kaiser has a bottleneck of information where they provide the doctors who work for Kaiser with pharmaceutical recommendations. So in this one case, the misinformation could be attributed directly to Pfizer. Um, and not to the docs got the information somewhere else. Um, so uh, Pfizer was, uh, Kaiser was awarded $47 million uh, for their fraudulent uh, marketing uh, to Kaiser. And that $47 million was tripled. So that comes out to $47, $141 million. Um, uh, but that was a pittance compared to the total amount that Pfizer had sold to Kaiser or in, to the world. They were selling $2 million a year of Neurontin, um, most of which was sold in the United States. That, that is jarring. Um, and it's just, you see this time and time again with civil action against pharmaceutical companies is that, you know, the sum might look massive uh, that they have to pay out to an untrained eye, but when you compare it to the profits, it really is nothing uh, based it, it compared to what they're they're making. It's the cost of doing business, and they're very willing to pay that cost of doing business. So let's talk about insulin, um, since I know we don't have a ton of time left. And this is a hot button issue for many people. One, because it's such a widely used drug in the United States. Um, it was a part of these reconciliation negotiations. Uh, unfortunately, didn't make it in. But um, also, I think it's it's used as a uh, campaign issue for some Democrats because, as I mentioned, it's so widely used. And two, it's so cheap to make and is so heavily gouged by the pharmaceutical industry. Talk a bit about insulin's role in um, in price gouging by uh, for-profit healthcare in this country and um, just the extent to which that is harming so many millions of people. Well, Emma, insulin is a perfect issue to talk about because there are two aspects to it. One is that the insulin, insulin used to be animal, a, animal insulin. It was patented in 1923 as uh, uh, extract of animal pancreases where the insulin was being made in the animals. And <clears throat> until 1982, all insulin came from animals. But in 1982, insulin became the first genetically engineered drug, and they could uh, splice the gene for human insulin into E. coli bacteria and have vats of E. coli bacteria turn into insulin manufacturing plants. In 1982, the first uh, genetically engineered insulin came out, and that was called recombinant human insulin. The molecular structure of that insulin was exactly the same as human insulin, though the folding of the protein was slightly different and it didn't function exactly as human insulin does. And then in uh, 1996, the uh, drug companies started to come out with a new class of insulin called insulin analogs, which were different than recombinant human insulin by one or two amino acids that reportedly got it to fold better and act in a more physiologic way. And, and it's those insulin analogs now that are the insulins that cost $300 per vial. Um, now, what happened is only three companies make the insulin analogs or have made the insulin analogs. So they acted as a cartel 
And the price of this insulin went from $21 a vial back when they first came out in 1996 to up to $300 a vial, an enormous price gouging. But the key here is that when drug companies gouge, they don't just gouge on price, they gouge on volume. And this is so important. And that this, what I'm going to tell you, has been lost in the debate. Nobody has said it in the debate about the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, 80 percent of the insulin that's used in the United States is used by people with type 2 diabetes, not type 1 diabetes. So they're manufacturing some insulin, but not enough to control their blood sugar. And you can't control the blood sugar with one or two other drugs. And they get put on insulin. Now, the drug companies went through this, and this is in the fourth chapter of my book, and the drug companies took over the medical standards from the doctors, and, and they uh, proliferated this idea that uh, insulin analogs were necessary in order to provide the full medical benefit to people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So, and it was in the New England Journal, and it was in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it was in the guidelines from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and so forth. And that became the standard of care, that insulin analogs were better than recombinant insulin, which was, as the price went up, the recombinant insulin only cost about a tenth as much um, than, as the insulin analogs. But the truth is, as I show in uh, chapter four, that the insulin analogs are not superior for the 80% of the people who are taking, uh, who have type 2 diabetes. And we're spending uh, about 10 times more on insulin analogs than we need to spend on recombinant hum human insulin to achieve the same outcome. Now, if you're a drug manufacturer, an insulin manufacturer, and there are uh, people like me who are starting to tell this story publicly, what do you do? And on top of which, the drug manufacturers are really facing a serious situation because there are nonprofit drug manufacturers coming online who can make and sell insulin analogs, not for $300 a vial, but for $35 a vial. They can actually manufacture and distribute the insulin for $35 a vial. So if you're a CEO of one of the uh, insulin analog makers, there's a brilliant solution to this, which is pass a law that says the copay for insulin that consumers will pay is no more than $35. So when, the, when these new insulins come out that only cost $35 come out and their doctor says, hey, you can get this biosimilar insulin for $35, the patients are going to say, because the pharmaceutical industry will be maximizing their PR efforts to convince them, the, the, the patients are going to say, well, I don't want that biosimilar uh, insulin. I hear from whatever news stories or whatever that it's not as good, besides which the expensive insulin, insulin analog, is only going to cost me $35. So the patients have no incentive to go to the less expensive insulin, and the insulin manufacturers are continue, continuing to charge their outrageous prices for insulin analogs when insulin analogs aren't even needed to take care of people with type 2 diabetes. So much of the problem with drugs has to do with the knowledge that's available to doctors. And this insulin copay of $35 is a brilliant mechanism to cover up that knowledge getting out. And, and in terms of the journal's uh, roles in this, uh, returning to where we started, towards the beginning of our interview, talking about the New England uh, Medical Journal, essentially basing their uh, publishings off of corporate influence summaries from these drug, man uh, drug manufacturers. How prevalent is that in th this case with the insulin analog, uh, insulin analog uh, incident? <laughs> well, in this case, we have the studies that are done this is another huge issue in American medicine. We have the studies that are done by the manufacturers of the insulin analogs, and they may show that insulin analogs uh, create a finer minute-by-minute um, -minute control of uh, insulin in people who use them. They'll make up an endpoint like that. That could be a real endpoint, but what they do not do and what they do not have to do 
is to actually do a study that compares the insulin analog to the older recombinant mm. human insulin to see if there's a clinical benefit. It's not been done. So those studies that the Cochrane reviews that look at that issue, you have to kind of take one set of studies and compare them to the results of another set of studies, but there's not been a head-on study. Well, and that's because the be? manufacturers pay. Yeah. Yeah, why would there be, right? That there's no profit incentive. They're not going to do a study on insulin analog versus uh, insulin. Exactly. There's not just a pro no profit incentive. There's a loss that's yeah. going to happen because their insulin isn't better. Um, so it's going to cost them a fortune if they do a study comparing the two. And if they thought their insulin was really better, you got to bet that they would have done the study. Oh, yeah. And um, lastly, before I let you go, what about public financing of some of these uh, studies as a, uh, a way to one of the prongs to combat this? Because, you know, we need some price caps like they have in other countries. Uh, we need, of course, single payer health care. That's the, the big white whale. Um, we need a lot of things. But in terms of, look, uh, right now Pfizer's taking all the credit for the COVID vaccine when taxpayer money, money was in, uh, integral in the development of uh, these COVID vaccines. Um, you know, so maybe as a, a path forward, what is your opinion on broader support for public financing of research uh, and having ta uh, some conditions attached to that um, due to the taxpayer investment? Absolutely, uh, or to, for the FDA to change its rules. So now the FDA has to prove that a diabetic drug isn't, doesn't have an adverse effect on cardiovascular events. Well, there's no reason to prove the diabetic drug, um, go, that, not to make the diabetic drug, the manufacturer, add in the best alternative therapy to compare to their drug um, so that you wouldn't even have to have public financing if you made the best active comparator mandatory for a study. Now... If that's too much to ask, your solution is exactly right. These studies are expensive, but they're not that expensive. We're wasting about $20 billion a year on insulin analogs for people with type 2 diabetes. And you could certainly have done a clinical trial of comparing the first generation and second generation of bioengineered insulin. Um, you could have done that uh, 20 years ago, and we would have known a whole lot more. And there's just one short point I want to make. When you have a drugs, drugs like um, statins to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease or diabetes for that matter, the drug companies never add a lifestyle arm to their studies. So if you wanna know, say, if lowering cholesterol with a statin reduces the risk of heart disease, a rational healthcare system would have a lifestyle arm in that so that we would see if lifestyle um, mm. was more effective or as effective as a statin and whether the two together were better than the two individually, you know, either one individually. There's just no reason for that. So that's an indication people aren't dumb. That's not an indication that they're not smart enough to add another arm. It's an indication of the power of the pharmaceutical industry to influence public policy. Because there really is no incentive to, to use that word again, to analyze lifestyle or to analyze or to do preventative care um, as a best practice, at, in addition to, of course, you know, manufacturing drugs that people need, but that's not even in the equation, it seems. That's exactly right. It, it doesn't have to not be in the equation. It could be part of American drug uh, regula regulatory policy that those studies have to be done, lifestyle studies, uh, best comparator studies, it's because of the enormous amount of influence that pharma has on both Democrats and Republicans that these things don't happen. It's not because people aren't smart. There are plenty of people who are smart, but this is a demonstration not of intellectual capacity. It's a demonstration of political power, just raw political power. Well, uh, and it's not going to get fixed <laughs> until Americans. It, it, let me just say this one thing at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to get fixed unless Americans can understand this, and it's gonna take programs like your program to get this information out to Americans so we can start to have this discussion. 
Well, I'm, I'm super grateful that you came on today to, to educate our audience on this because it was, it was really uh, interesting and necessary information. Dr. John Abramson, physician, uh, lecturer at Harvard Medical School and author of Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare and How We Can Repair It. Uh, John, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Of course. All right, folks, with that, we are going to head into the fun half of this program shortly. But first, Matt, what is happening in the Matt Luckian media universe? Left Reckoning is on Tuesdays now, tonight. Yep, we'll be uh, talking uh, abortion with Lillian Turchia of uh, What's Left of Philosophy podcast, a really, really smart uh, philosophy podcast. Also, uh, I'll be talking about student loans um, and uh, going through a little bit of the history of uh, well, how we decided to um, uh, use student loans as a, as a sort of vehicle for debt bondage for um, uh, young people. And uh, on Thursday, I believe it's going to be on Thursday, I'll be airing a conversation on ayahuasca with Joshua Khan Russell, where we talk for about an hour about his experience. And uh, it's interesting. Like, it, it's not something that I um, personally, like, it, it, it seems, like, he talks about it as medicine, not as a drug. And I think that is um, a good reason as to why I, it kind of scares me away from being serious about doing it, although the way he makes um, his um, Brazil retreats, uh, Amazon rainforest, I think, and maybe it's not Brazil, but Amazon retreats does sound interesting. But uh, yeah, we get into it for about an hour. So uh, look forward to that on the uh, Left Reckoning YouTube channel. Yeah, maybe he was uh, he was joining with Aaron Rodgers, who recently spoke about his ayahuasca experience on uh, on see on the podcast. exactly. See that that's kind of why we're doing this is uh, we don't want all the people talking about this to be sort of like um, downstream of Joe Rogan <laughs> type <laughs> bros, and I'm not saying Aaron Rodgers is uh, he's sort of that. He is kind of that, isn't he? Um, so yeah, we're gonna try to. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Emma. Um, Still breaks my heart. All right. Uh, but I can't help it. I still root for him. I, it's just like, it's, you know, I don't know if you still like Kyrie at all, Matt, but it's kind oh, of absolutely, similar. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm locked in for the next net season now that uh, Kevin Durant said he's no longer uh, trying to get a trade or, or Steve Nash fired. I'm ready to go. One of the worst sports fans things about me is I still hate, I still hate Aaron Rodgers' current and former coaches more than him for it, not for Rodgers' personal antics, more for the coaches and oh. front office people for not being able to get him back to a Super Bowl. Are you kidding me? Yes, of course. Like it Mike is just McCarthy a waste is, of talent. It is just such a waste. Mike McCarthy and like the Packers management is way more unlikable than Aaron Rodgers. There I said it. Um, if I was him, I would I would I don't know what would stop me from like actually committing violence. Yeah. Uh <laughs> never seen a team run itself like it's you know decades behind the rest of the league and also be such a storied franchise it's bizarre but anyway uh that's a discussion for another day 646-257-3920 is the phone number we'll be taking a few calls getting into some clips see you in the fun half three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now. And I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now. And I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now. But I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. On Matt! Who? Fun hat. What is up, everyone? Fun hat. No me key. You did it! Fun hat. Let's Fun go, bear. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hat. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. Everyone, I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women. Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Uh, 7 eight. Yes. Hi, me? This me? Yes. Is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello? Is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? No sound. Every single freaking day. 
What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. I'm going to go Scott Libertarians. They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him. So what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857-210-35-501-1-3-8. for instance. $3,400, $1,900. five, four, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. Of- but, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> The week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. Anyway. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, this, Look, um, gotta jump. You gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Um, Two o'clock, we're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, Sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. Back. What's up, guys? Welcome to the fun half. The phone's have been turned on. So if you'd like to call in, the voicemail is off. 646-257-3920. Let's read some IMs. Ron Quixote says, Andrew Luck was a bigger waste of talent by the Colts than Aaron Rodgers. Listen to the Athletics podcast, Luck. It's infuriating as a former Colts fan, but also a good story of, on personal and mental health superseding the glory of NFL success. Um, no offense, Ron uh, Quixote. That is a, not correct. Aaron Rodgers is the could have been the greatest quarterback of all time, given his physical abilities and also mental abilities um, to, to, to actually play the position. But Andrew Luck was a great talent. I mean, Andrew Luck was a top five quarterback when he was playing. Aaron Rodgers was the best quarterback in the league for like seven years in a row. So, um, and like still is, I would say still is top five in his late thirties. And, 